We are humbled today to have the honor to welcome His Holiness the Dalai Lama at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. The title of today's event is Universal Human Values and Education. At first, I was surprised by the, worst, by the word universal. I asked myself, can a value be universal? As a scientist, my answer is clearly no. Nothing is universal except the fundamental law of physics. Everything else is changing with time and place. Values are no exception. It seems therefore maybe a little bit exaggerated to speak about universal values, at least at first sight. But at second glance, it looks quite different. The universality in question is not related to an observed fact. It is related to our profound conviction, to our will. We are talking about values like tolerance, justice, freedom. Such values want to be released from any temporal and spatial borders. They have to be universal. From this point of view, it is not only appropriate to speak about universal value, it is important, it is very important. Important for us as a university in times when values are becoming increasingly important in education. Teaching is no longer just about facts, particularly in the course of digitalization. Personal skills such as creativity, social and intercultural competencies are becoming more and more important, more important also for us as a university. Yet, before I introduce our university, let me talk about the audience today. Here in this room, we have about 700 people and 300 more are present via video transmission. They are in rooms nearby or in the same buildings or in other places. But they all are present. All together, more than 1,000 people here come together to welcome you today. In total, the Zurich University of Applied Sciences, about 12,000 students and 3,000 staff members. Our, however, our university is much more than the sum of these people. Our, our university is also the values and the ideals we share. Let me tell you about these values and ideals we live up to at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. As an institution, we have a duty and a mission. A duty is assigned. A mission is something we choose ourselves. First, I would like to say something about our duty as a university. We want to teach our students how to think scientifically and rationally. We accept this duty not because it is imposed to us. We accept it because we truly believe in it and we are convinced of its importance and its value. The scientific approach follows rules rejecting any forms of ideology. It relies on the integrity of each researcher. It is based on the commitment of each scientific community to generate new knowledge and to disseminate it, to discuss it openly. Scientific thinking is an attitude requiring tolerance and the willingness to engage in a dialogue 
beyond cultural and political borders. To be anchored in a scientific and rational tradition is one important cornerstone of our university, but it is also our responsibility as an institution to make sure that our students are well prepared to enter the job market. That is why the other cornerstone of our, uni of our university is practice-oriented education and research. Students must be ready to face the challenges they will meet in the future. In addition, with our practice-oriented research, we also contribute in finding solutions for the societal challenges. Yet, we want more than a science-based and practice-oriented education for our students. We want them to become responsible citizens. We want them to get personally involved in society. We would like them to improve our society. And this is our mission. We are living in a world which is subject to profound changes. In order to keep up with those changes, our students will need to understand other cultures. They will need to understand other way of thinking. A university degree is much more than a confirmation of a successful degree. It should be an acknowledgement of shared fundamental values as a, and as a commitment to responsibility. Therefore, you should not be surprised that your visit draws such attention among the students and the staff members of our university. It is precisely because you represent so many of these values. It is because of the symbolism of your position as a spiritual leader and as an ambassador of peace and dialogue between cultures. Thank you for being here today, Your Holiness, and welcome. We would like now to listen to your words. What? <laughs> I think silent meditation. It's your turn, Your Holiness. I see. You have the first round. People are really looking forward oh. to listening to your words concerning the topic of today's session. Respected elder brothers and sisters and the rest of the brothers and sisters. I think many of you, I think this first time meeting with me. But as soon as my face appeared, you immediately realize, oh, one human being. <laughs> no need introduction. Isn't it? For me also, whenever I saw one human being, I immediately feel, oh, human brother, sister. So then, therefore, I deliberately start whenever I talk brothers, sisters. It's not use the different sort of individual name and the different rank. Firstly, I can't remember these different names <laughs> and the position, but simply, I think a lot of problem with too much emphasis on secondary level of differences. So, firstly, different nation, different or say the religion, and different community within same religion, same country, but differences of uh, richer family, poor family, uh, like that. So too much emphasis on this secondary level of differences, that really causing problem, making division, we and they. 
And then, sometimes instead of helping them as a human brother, but you see, you really try to create trouble for them. Today's world, besides nature disaster, many problems are own creation. Firstly, a lot of killing. And in some cases, starvation. This is due to too much discrimination. So this problem is our own cause of creation. So as a result, I think world as a whole, not very happy world, a lot of problems. Because we too much emphasis on secondary level of differences, distrust, suspicion. That's today's reality. I think ancient time, of course, firstly, human population very small, but their very life depend on the community. So work together, whatever they get sh something, share each other. Eventually, our population increase, then uh, we create a lot of uh, different community, different country, uh, so this, I feel, the differences on secondary level really uh, cause a lot of problems. This is European continent. Uh, the past 20th, 20th century, First World War, Second World War. Why? If at that time people have sense of also one continent, same. I think that this killing will not happen. But too much happens. My nation, their nation. Nowadays in the Middle East, even religion causing killing. My religion, their religion. So, a lot of problem, human created problem. That kind of problem, our responsibility to reduce these problems, since we created. So pray to God, is relevant. Since these problems we created, so we have the responsibility to reduce this and eventually eliminate this man-made problem. Global warming, some other thing, beyond our control. So I often telling people, uh, people generally, particularly people who have some religious faith, they always pray, pray. Pray to God, pray to Allah, so on. If we have the opportunity meeting with uh, Jesus Christ or Buddha or Muhammad and ask them, please bring peace on this planet. I think they most probably, they respond, who created violence? Who created problem? Not by God. You human being. So you have the responsibility to solve this problem. You created a problem and ask me peace. Illogical. <laughs> That's the reality. Now time come. We suppose more civilized. I think uh, during 20th century, I think one century, early part of 20th century, First World War, Second World War, after Second World War, 
later part of the 20th century, firstly, European Union start. So these are, you see, thinking, interest for common, rather than my nation or my country. Consider one sort of entity where, no. uh, on global level, European. So I really admire the spirit of European Union. I always tell you, I admire De Gaulle, uh, Adana, these two persons. During wartime, arch enemy. But as a many picture I saw De Gaulle, big nose. <laughs> so arch enemy of uh, Germany. But after Second World War, they realize now we have to think common interest for this continent. Russia, at that time, something different. East, Eastern European, something different. So, so European Union, I am one of the strong admirer of European Union. So it is quite clear, after European Union uh, set up or start, I think at least member state, uh, I think last few decades, no longer any fighting, killing. If European Union not develop, I think last few decades, maybe some killing. Now, British are living, they have their own, sort of, I think, selfish, narrow-minded thinking, I feel. And historically, with Tibet, and because of British India, we have a very close link. But I feel, you see, some of their thinking is uh, the early part of the 20th century, British imperialist, so they do not want to listen to say, suggestions or order from Brussels or Berlin. <laughs> so uh, many Britishers now, you see, they complain. So European Union is one example. <coughs> so now, you see, since many problems which we are facing is due to too much emphasis on individual nation, including different religious tradition. So now only remedy is go deeper level. We are same human being, same human brothers, sisters. And the same way to born, same way to die. So I deliberately try to uh, share, let's say, we are the same human being. We, we all, seven billion human beings, the same way to born. Now more important, the scientists, some scientists, uh, through their sort of, say, the investigation, uh, basic human nature is more compassionate. There's so one occasion, one meeting with scientists. There's so one, I said, the cartoon. There's a show to one young baby, six months old, language not yet developed. So influence from outside, I think very little, because this is not yet developed language. They only experience mother's love oh, and mother's milk. So such very young child, the cartoon, 
let's say one part, let's say two young children uh, helping each other uh, with smile. That cartoon show to the young child. The child smiling, express as a clear expression of joyful. And then second part of the cartoon, two children, you see, instead of helping, but you see the negative attitude, one another, and that uh, show to the child. When even a child, six month old child, seeing some expression of unhappiness. Then more important, the child, the, the, I mean, also the human being who have constant anger, hatred, actually eating our immune system. In order to uh, preserve our physical health, peace of mind. Peace of mind never come with anger, jealousy, or suspicion. Peace of mind come only loving kindness here. And also, we human beings are social animals. Each individual's survival depends on the community. So therefore, even if there's some uh, or say the, uh, individual who really spent uh, many years in hermit life, one occasion in uh, Barcelona, I met one Catholic monk. The uh, or say the, casa, the, the people, you see, who organized my visit, uh, they told me one Catholic monk who spent five years in the mountain behind our city, Casa Montsroch. So, then I am very, very happy to receive him. Then he come. Uh, I'm very happy to talk with him, my broken English, because his English much worse than me. <laughs> so I have more courage to speak with him. <laughs> so then I asked him, I was told, you spend five years in the mountain, very hermit life. And I asked him, what kind of you uh, practice or meditate? His answer is, meditate on love. When he mentioned that, in his eye, I noticed something special significance. Now my point here is, you see, he, five years in mountain, hermit life, uh, but without the uh, rest of human community, he can't survive. So even though he, such, such, such person deliberately isolate from the society and, I say, the hermit life, wonderful, but basically uh, without human community, he can't, he can't survive, like that. So we are social animal. Individuals' life depend on the community. So any social life, social animal, emotionally, there's one factor which bring together. That's human love. We human beings, as a social animal, we need friend. Friendship happen entirely based on trust. Without trust, 
cannot develop genuine friendship. In order to develop uh, trust, you should show them sense of concern of their well-being. Then trust will come. Trust uh, will not come with money, with power, with just mere education, but warm-heartedness, because we are a social animal. I think animal, like dog, they also very much appreciate or trust. They don't care about uh, money, about how to say the power. Even you see, uh, they they do not sort of how to say they know uh, uh, education, knowledge, but simply showing compassionate face and eye. Then they appreciate, isn't it? So I think we also, basically, social animal. So we very much appreciate human friendship uh, in order to or say they create happy family, happy community. So friendship is very essential. So now that uh, the sense of community is very important. Then that community, in ancient time, you Swiss people in the mountain, through hard work, and a small community, <laughs> we Tibetan also, uh, in uh, what is it, the mountainous area, a lot of snow, and small, small community. Now today, not like that. Modern economy, no national boundary. So therefore, now human community, in the sense, I think, entire human being is one human community. So, so I use the word sense of global responsibility. Think humanity and consider yourself part of that. So taking care of the global human being is ultimately taking care, best way, taking care of yourself. Is it selfish? You ask, I mean, Taking care of oneself, in that sense, we are selfish. Without that, we can't survive. And the human evolution, you see, on that basis, you see, evolution come. So, uh, but since we are a community or social animal, and particularly in our today's world, the reality is East depend, future of East depend West, West depend East, South, North, like that. So just a big, just one big human community. So we really need a sense of global responsibility on the basis of concept oneness of entire seven billion human beings. Although all religion uh, taught us, teaching us, uh, we are same human brothers, sisters. And according to the religion, we all created by one God, Creator. I consider that like our Father. So seven million human beings come from one Father. That Father, infinite love. So if you uh, follow that teaching sincerely, seriously, then no way to kill each other. We all, human brothers, sisters, children of one God. Then, according uh, non-theistic religious tradition, 
see, harming other, you get uh, suffering. Helping other, you get also the joyfulness, happiness. So those religion, no concept of creator, but you see the uh, very much emphasis each individual's behavior be should be non-violent. Violence creates suffering for other, and ultimately you yourself also suffer. So non-violent teaching, very helpful. The first lay not harming other. Result, you feel happy. You get more friend. Harming other, you create deliberately more enemy. Nobody want enemy. Everybody want friend. Friendship uh, not come, not not um, cannot buy. Ultimately, peace of mind. If big sort of market, where? Supermarket. Supermarket. If you go supermarket and shouting, I want to buy peace of mind. I think people laughing at that person. Maybe a little problem here. <laughs> so peace of mind must create by yourself. And taking drugs, alcohol, will not bring peace of mind. Home heartedness, peace of mind, very much based on the what is it, a compassionate mind. So now scientists, as I mentioned earlier, already basic human nature is more compassionate. So therefore, I feel now the problem is the children. I think around three year old, four year, five year. Still, the basic human value, human love, human compassion, very alive. Because they are survival, they are day by day, the mother's loving kindness and friends' sort of love, very sort of relevant. And then, grown up, once join education. Not talking about this inner value. Just concentrate brain. And then the whole nation who come from that kind of education and then materialistic uh, culture, materialistic life. Not much talking, this inner value. I think education system, I feel some responsibility modern education system, very much oriented about material value, uh, not adequate emphasis in a value. Now time come, we cannot rely on only religious teaching for inner value. Now it is growing, more and more people and young people, let's say, uh, uh, not much faith. So indication in America and other European countries, I noticed it's a big Christian church, Christian monastery, now more or less empty. So people, I think, genuine, serious interest about religion declining. When modern education, uh, a separate institution which taking care about education. At that two years, I think 200 years ago, then the church take care about our inner value. And then gradually in the society, the influence of church, a little bit declining. So now the, the education institution alone should take both responsibility, education and warm heartedness. So now, uh, uh, education institution should pay more attention about this inner value. Not based on religion, but based on human universal value. 
So, uh, one year old, two years, three years, no religion, no faith. But they are very much appreciate human love. So human love is universal. Religion uh, never be universal. Group, 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 like that. So therefore, uh, uh, here I think very useful. Indian tradition, the secular way. When I use the word secular in the West, some of my friends, some Christians, some Muslims, they're a little bit sort of uh, uh, uncomfortable. They uh, suggest to me you should, you should not use the word secular because in the West, secular uh, means disrespect religion and the distance from religion. Whereas in India, the meaning of secular is respect all religion and also respect non-believer. So that's very relevant. Today's world, out of seven billion human beings, one billion non-believer. If we, you see, the, these deeper human value based on religious faith, then over one billion will not show any interest. So the secular way educate about inner value. Now here I often you see telling in school, in education, hygiene of physical uh, included in children, isn't it? Hygiene of physical, how to take care of their body. Now similarly, we need hygiene of emotion should include not only take care of your physical health. Similarly, they should teach how to take care about our emotion. Healthy mind. So healthy body, healthy mind, strictly uh, uh, secular way, not based on religious belief. Okay. So that's my, what is it? These ideas uh, come many years meeting with uh, people from different country and different background, different culture. Uh, and then important number of scientists, educationists. So therefore, now these days, whenever I have opportunity meeting with people, I always say share is in these points. So now, is it clear the, the secular ethics, Kasa? Universal ethics. First, a warm round of applause for these first insights of the Dalai Lama. King, King, King. Your Holiness, a warm welcome from my side as well. It's a pleasure to have you here and we all feel honored, as we would say in Swiss German, schön sind Sie bei uns, wir freuen uns, dass Sie mit uns Ihre Ansichten teilen. Well, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I only, one German language, Deutschland, only that word. Now, I think for you, being the Dalai Lama, you can afford not to remember people's names, but allow me to introduce this fine round of distinguished minds. Kasa. They are all people who um, share the idea of universal well, human rights in their daily work and their yep. daily life. So, please allow me to introduce our guests. We have Christiane Hohenstein with us. She is a professor of interculturality and language diversity at Zeta Avi School of Applied Linguistics. With us is Andreas Gerbergrote. He's a member of the executive board of the university. He is um, head of research and development and he's director of the School of Health Professions. Now, the youngest panelist is Leandro Huber. 
He is head of the Students' Association at ZAW. He just finished his bachelor degree in communications and he will start off, or he has started, studying economics. And also with us is Rudi Höcker. He is deputy president of the Tibet Institute Recon. He's involved in the project Science Meets Dharma, a yes, project that you in, um, started almost I 20 years ago that promotes teaching science to monks and nuns in Tibetan monasteries. Now, before we start discussing what it means to promote universal human values in education, I must ask you a personal question. If you allow, Dalai Lama, self-discipline is part of the values that you promote, but rumor has it that you were a lazy student. <laughs> I think it is quite natural. Uh, when I carry study, very lazy student. <laughs> so that's true then. Hmm? I think most of most of you, I think same. When, <laughs> when we st study. At young age, not much interest, isn't it? And particularly our sort of system. Uh, from young age, we have to uh, learn through memorize. Memorization. Memorization. Symbol. Lunzi. No? So, my case, I think seven, seven year old already started uh, to learn by heart some root text. And then occasionally, you see, they, we show our sort of Dakasore, uh, knowledge to our teacher, and teacher kept the text. We suppose we learned by heart. So, no, no scripture. Not only my, my, my own case, this is some of my sort of friend, they have this story, beautiful story. You see, uh, their teacher, uh, eyesight not very good. So, the young, as a young student, uh, the, the text kept by teacher, but teacher cannot see properly. So, uh, and then the young student is supposed to see uh, recite by heart, but reading the text. <laughs> I didn't have that that kind of sort of experience. But some of my friends they told me uh, they are quite expert to uh, to, to to cheat their teacher. <laughs> so I guess, I guess your holiness, cheating is not one of the universal human values that you want to promote <laughs> cheating or cheating, that's today. Right, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So, no, but in any way, when I start learning these things, I have no interest. Simply, I consider burden. Then, age 13. 14. Uh, and then I start some interest to practice these things. Then at my age 16, the political situation changed. We lost our own freedom, a lot of difficulties. But at that time, the uh, lesson which I learned is very, very useful. Then gradually, we lost our own country. 
and come to India as a refugee, then this knowledge is really useful to keep in our strength. Like that. Now let us talk about the lessons that you learned. You, you promote values like forgiveness, compassion, tolerance, contentment, self-discipline, and we would like to do a reality check now. Where do we find these values in today's education? Allow me to start with our youngest panelist, Leandro Huber. Have you come across such values during your studies? Are they, so to speak, part of the textbook? Um, I think some of the values are sh clearly part of the textbook, but uh, I think more often, I, I really meet those values in school together with classmates, together with teachers, together with other people. Um, but still, I think um, some of the values you have spoken about, um, we clearly meet in class as well. Yes. Such as? Um, for example, we do learn, the, in general, the values of science in total, so objectivity, such values. And then also, especially in the studies of communication, we do learn uh, the values of journalism. Um, one of which, which uh, was always the most important to me, was uh, audiatur et altera pars, um, which means listen to the other side as well. And this is really one of those values which I kept the most from my studies. And when the Dalai Lama also said that the hygiene of the emotions should be part of the curriculum, so to speak, do you think that is something that we have to come across? It's different to, to um, it's difficult to say. I think um, the education at the university is really more focused on the education of the mind rather than the education of the heart. So I think this is really more the focus in today's higher uh, education in higher, yeah. So educational leaders, they can try to implement these values in their everyday lessons and lectures, but I am asking you, Andreas Gerbergrote, being a member of the executive board of that university, do universal human values, are they somehow part of an overarching strategy of the school? Well, let me briefly start to give a high welcome and uh, thank you to the Dalai Lama, uh, Your Holiness, for coming and sharing your deep insights from many years because uh -huh. this will help us to improve our strategy and mission and our uh, reflection about uh, values that we want to uh, teach to our students and that we want to live up to. So thank you very much for coming. And this will give me the chance to briefly um, talk about our mission statement in which we... Um, I, I'm not sure whether you can call them human uh, uh, universal values, but in which we have l laid out some of the values that also the Dalai Lama touched on. For example, sustainability in the sense that we are responsible for our environment, and that means the whole environment, not only the Swiss environment, but as his... Holiness pointed out the whole world. And also that uh, our students learn to reflect and that they uh, always have a, a reflective stance towards what they are doing, towards what, uh, uh, and, 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 and constantly reflect themselves. For example, in my field, the health professions, that they reflect what is their role as a health profession if they encounter patients that think differently, that feel differently, etc. So, um, and maybe a third point, and I know this from several of our schools, we, and, and Christiana maybe will uh, touch upon that as well. We also have a strong focus of um, teaching into professional uh, learning. So there's, these are maybe three values that are similar of what uh, His Holiness spoke about. Would you say this is enough? Or is the visit of the Dalai Lama somehow as a starting point for some resolution to maybe put more <laughs> emphasis on these values? Maybe not for a resolution, but uh, maybe this today is like uh, a self-reflection of the whole school. As you can see, there are 700 people here and a more, several more hundred uh, watching at the TV stations in 
our different halls. So and quite maybe, pressure, quite a lot of pressure. <laughs> maybe not necessarily pressure. I mean, um, it, it's more a question of this. This this will make uh, bring us into discussion. And uh, for example. Uh, sustainability is one of the strongest values that we have in our mission. But then maybe we really want to discuss what, what that will mean for us. I mean, what, what does sustainability mean for our scientific research? What does sustainability mean for us as a researcher? Uh, how often should we fly to another continent or should we rather not fly? I mean, this is a question of sustainability. And uh, so we, we need to discuss this. And I know there is not one single recipe, but then maybe it will help us to, to think about how we as a school uh, want to define what is sustainable for us in our daily lives as professors, teachers, as students. As a continuous dialogue as well. Now, one could also sum up the Dalai Lama's vision with the sentence that we do not come to reason through understanding alone. We have to put more emphasis on inner values. Rudi Höcker, when we talked on the phone, you said, oh, I, I just have this concrete example in my mind, what that means in your daily teaching. Could you share that with us? Can I use a picture to share it? Of course you may. I see, I would call these our prepared panelists, you know, they're well prepared, I see. <laughs> Maybe you show it to the audience as well. This photograph was taken in a Tibetan monastery in India in a science introduction course organized by the Tibet Institute for Monks. Two teachers, one lady, one gentleman, one biologist, one uh, physicist, taught monk students how to dissect fish. The students had been given professional dissecting tools but the illumination was bad, so they used their personal phones to illuminate the workplace. The purpose of the exercise was to teach anatomy and to enhance skills in the use of scientific tools. Organ by organ, they took it out, the heart, the liver, the swim bladder, and when the exercise draw to its end, they lifted out the spinal cord and the brain of the fish and had it in their hand. And then one student asked, Madam, is this where consciousness originates? There was a moment of silence. The teacher stopped to reflect. And then she said, the Western scientific hypothesis is that there is no consciousness without these organs, but whether or not there is more to consciousness, Western science doesn't know. And then again, a long moment of silence, an intensive silence, and it was at that moment that I realized what the enormous value of that moment was. It was the moment when a door was opened to new knowledge for the students, but behind the door, an immense world of non-knowledge opened too. And what united Western scientists and Buddhist monks at that moment was the respect for both these worlds, the world of science in front and the world behind of it, which has no scientific explanation. There was a humility in that, and an enormous unifying eff effect between the cultures and the religions. That, for me, was very impressive. 
And I also believe that you hope that um, moments like these would be a more normal situation in everyday curriculum, and not only in like a Tibet Institute. Thank you for sharing this with us, Mr. Höcker. Now, Christiane Hohenstein, your field is interculturality. So when we talk about universal human values as such, do they exist according to your world? Well, um, thank you, and hello, everybody. Actually, um, it's very difficult um, or hard to say uh, that universal human values exist. I personally believe they don't exist yet. Um, when speaking about universal values, we easily forget that we are taking a certain perspective of our own, and that perspective actually is not a shared perspective among all humankind. That perspective we tacitly take to be universal is forged by our own experiences and needs. And someone raised in another country um, in another educational system, within another language, will not hold values or have needs um, and will not have acquired um, the same learning techniques as we, are, as we have. Um, think, for example, um, of languages operating on principles other than the Indo-European family and the Latin alphabet. And Tibetan is one a very good example of that. Numerous Indian languages, Arabic, Hebrew, um, African languages. All languages um, with a character-based uh, writing system, such as Chinese or Japanese, where you have to learn the writing system separately from the spoken language um, at the same time. And this is um, a cognitive, a very hard effort, and it takes much longer than learning um, Latin or German or any alphabet um, language. Or sign languages, for example, that do not have their own written language, and sign language users need to um, use the spoken language of their surrounding in order to write and read. Uh, write and read. If you allow me to, you know, to leave mm. the field of linguistics yeah. and you know, look at the values at itself, what is it that you think is difficult with the concept of a universal um, human values? Um, well, um, we need to be able to change our stance, to change and shift our perspective. That is one um, uh, important part of learning intercultural communication and teaching interculturality. Um, we need intercultural reflection, and um, I also mean we need, um, I mean by that we need a reflection on inclusion, on inclusive language, on inclusive interaction, and ways how we can bring about it. Um, and part and parcel of this inclusion for me um, is as well um, tackling the gender gap that still exists in all uh, human societies. Um, and that is um, ingrained as a concept of um, inequality between women and men um, in all religions I know of. Um, so that surely is um, a point we need to tackle in order to, uh, to come to, to create universal, truly universal human values um, where men and women are um, conceived of as human beings in the same way. And that is not the case yet, I think. Let me pass mm -hmm. this point to the Dalai Lama. I'll wait until the translation has finished. So basically, to sum up, you say as long as there is no equality um, between men and women concerning their rights, it's difficult to talk about the concept of universal human rights in education. Your Holiness, what shall we do with this situation? At the emotional level, there are not much differences. And the mental level, also not much differences. Physical level, yes, male, some extra instrument. Do not elaborate, do not hmm? elaborate. 
don't shy. <laughs> uh, these things are, I think, normal nature. <laughs> so, but you have, you see here, more sort of, because of the uh, instrument. So basically, we are same. We are same. And most important, everyone want happy life. So everyone have right, no differences, male and female. I think ancient time, uh, male physically more sort of, how should they, kasoda, more stronger. So ancient time, the, I think very ancient time, no concept of leader, equal small family work together and whatever they get share together then gradually number increase then uh, they consider my sort of my consider, huh? possessions oh my possessions and a farm my farm right and then steal or these things happen and bully. So then people realize, oh, now we need one leader who uh, look after you see, these injustice or these things. So then no education. So in order to become leader, the physical strength. So male dominance then come, even some religion also male dominance come. So then education uh, develop. Education bring equal. Many leaders uh, in recent years in the world, female. So education brings equal. So now still the century old, thousand year old are sort of or a certain sort of habit still there. So we need more effort. Because of the... For equality. Uh, because of gender equality. Gender equality. Gender equality. equality. Is something very necessary uh, through education. And sometimes uh, maybe necessary, some demonstrations like that. And we all know that you've been trying also hard to um, improve the situation of women in religion as well. And we all know that there's many strong women, meanwhile, also physically around. Let me um, pick out one point that you made in the beginning of your statement. When you were looking at the world, you've been promoting universal human values for so many years now. Compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, empathy. When we want to teach these values in school, these students, they look at the world as it is today. And they see, for example, wars going on in Syria, Yemen, terrorist attacks. We've got a situation with the Rohingya. We've got a wall being built in the United States. We've got Europe struggling with a refugee crisis. So how shall young students believe in these values when they see that the world is in a shape that is not according with these principles. Does this worry you? Correct. Me? Yes, Your Holiness. How, how shall young people believe in the principles you are trying to promote, seeing the state of the world as it is? Ah. Hmm. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of problem with too much emphasis on secondary level of differences. So therefore, now in order to reduce problem, uh, including killing, Also the, on the secondary level of differences. So now we must 
more sort of effort. Basically, we are the same. That's very important, I feel. But what do educational leaders do when, for example, the students ask questions? There was a, an intercantonal conference of educational leaders in Switzerland, from Bern, uh, Freiburg, Neuchâtel, and they've come up with the question, how do we leaders, educational leaders, um, bring our young people uh, towards you know, optimism? and confidence that we will live up to these universal human values when the world is at its at the moment. I think one simple I think, example, when Swiss more or less isolated, then way of thinking that generations uh, and modern world, modern Switzerland, much more connection with outside, different country and even different continent. So we are thinking, there are, I think, differences there. Originally, just your own small community, uh, self-sufficient. Self, self now, gradually, technology and global economy develop, and then everyone related to each other. So as a result, you see mental, Mental level also is a way of thinking, some change. As a Tibetan, uh, firstly, as he came to India, uh, when they, their own uh, village, very so small village, no idea. Once you see they reach India, something different. And also, you see, they seeing different institutions. Very helpful. I think Indian Muslim, you see, because they are from childhood, they already know there are different religious traditions there. So they take for granted several religions, several truths. Whereas in uh, Arab world, isolated, only one religion. Muslim. So, one truth, one religion. So people, you see their attitude towards different religion, something different. So environment makes differences. So more wider sort of, wider contact brings more wider thinking. Just think small area. And then the way of thinking is also a little bit narrow-minded. One reason why people admire you so highly is because also your optimism is contagious. And, and before um, coming here, lots of people ask me the question, does, does, does the Dalai Lama promoting universal human values ever doubt these values, you know, I mean, we don't have to go into depth of politics, but also looking at the Rohingya situation where, you know, actually Buddhism is compassion, is love, but what's going on is not according to the principles I believe in. Is there at any time a doubting Dalai Lama? No. <laughs> Without self-confidence, you cannot say forcefully <laughs> the thing which you are talking and you yourself not fully convinced. Then how can how can speak? I said uh, regularly or forcefully. What do you think? When I talk to you at a certain sort of point, do you think more sort of forceful or weak? What, what do you think? So, so they convince Kasoda, any Kasoda subject which you are talking to other people, unless you yourself, without sort of convi convince, uh, conviction, 
difficult. So I have full conviction these things through my own practice, through my own experience. Firstly, uh, the Buddhist tradition and other religious tradition, you see, entire human being, as I mentioned earlier, you see, children of God. Then, Asian, so different religious tradition. Not only human being, we also use it uh, talk and entire sentient being and a limitless world, limitless uh, galaxies, sentient being in different galaxies. Also, you see, like us, want happiness, do not want suffering. So therefore, the, our daily prayer, we always think entire sentient being. So then, seven million human beings, very small here. And this, our planet, also one of them. Limitless galaxies. And each galaxy is limitless of stars and planets. So these thinking, really is open our mind. Allow me to pick out one part of your vision. Um, you've been saying several times that this world would become a more peaceful place if educational leaders and universities and schools would put more emphasis what you called the education of the heart, also with uh, your um, concept of secular ethics that the well-being of others should be at the core of decision-making. Um, let's make a second reality check, the education of the heart. What does this mean um, in a daily on a daily basis at university? How do we teach the education of the heart? Well, maybe let me start not with the answer from my perspective as the director or dean, but more personal perspective. When I came here two and a half years, I uh, wanted to give an introductory speech to the uh, staff of my school. And interestingly enough, uh, I talked about some values that uh, we didn't touch upon today, but which I think are very important and that you cannot teach, but that, that you can uh, live and then people realize what you're talking about. For example, one is humor and that is a very important uh, trait that I see also in His Highness the Dalai Lama. I think humor is very important and you can teach humor but you can live it and then in meetings, in, in discussions, in a class people realize there is humor or also being brave. I think being brave is something very important that you cannot teach, but you can try to share it through living. For example, if you see something that's totally wrong, you can change it, you can at least name it and showing, yes, this is the why I am brave in this situation. And like this, I think we can, we can share some education of the heart with, with our students and with our colleagues. But I think you can teach it like in a book. You can only teach it through an example or maybe through stories. I think in the Jewish tradition we have lots of stories so you can share it with, with stories that maybe illustrate what does braveness mean, what does humor mean in a certain situation and what, what can humor help or how can humor help in a certain situation? Those are some of my examples. But what does this mean in concrete terms? I mean, we all know that the Dalai Lama has a great sense of humor. Yes. But not everyone has got a great sense of humor. And then you have a staff in next to you and they say, you have to be funny now in your classroom. No, that's not the way you do it. <laughs> you just realize in, in a situation like the Dalai Lama, he's just laughing at something that he even himself says. And that's like the way you can do it. You laugh at, at maybe yourself or you make fun of something that, that happened to you in the morning or you tell uh, something like that. Not, not, not fun mm -hmm. uh, that you make about other people or fun in the sense that mm -hmm. you tell, now we have to be funny. 
And then you realize, I mean, there's this saying, like, we all like to sit next to really thick opera singers because when they go like, ha, 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 it's like so <laughs> relaxing and, and they don't tell you a joke or anything. It's just the way these thick opera thing singers are. And that's, I think, the way we can convey to each other that it's humor. And and for me, that's, that's a way of living that... Uh, so it's also about creating a, a, a light atmosphere to learn and to study and yes, to be Yes, but not in the sense, well, I have to create a light atmosphere, but in the sense that I'm, I'm coming and, and that's, that's how I want the whole situation at my school or at the whole set Ha'ave. So the Dalai Lama's concept of education of the heart also implies uh, empathy, for example. From your point of view, uh, Christiane Hohenstein, does this make sense to you? Um, yes, basically, of course. Um, I only um, feel that um, maybe empathy is a term we need to explain and not everybody may understand the same thing um, when talking about empathy. Um, you might um, uh, think uh, that people who are passionately protesting and aligning themselves, for example, with right-wing groups when protesting, they have a passion, and that is a kind of empathy as well. So do they have the wrong empathy? Do we have to promote a certain kind of empathy? What do we mean by empathy? That's very important. And um, that is also um, part of, of cultural um, and intercultural reflection, to reflect about um, what the other side um, may feel, think, what the mental, um, uh, and the, the, the horizon of beliefs of the other side is. And you may have to put yourself in the shoes of your opponent, um, even if you, you don't really like him or her, but you need to try in order to understand the point of view um, he or she is coming from, and he or she might think that you are uh, unreasonable, the bad guy, and... Um, not in the right way of empathy. So what would you suggest in concrete terms? How do we then uh, train ourselves in dealing with empathy in everyday lectures and university days? Well, um, actually, we, we do try to do that, but it's, it's not easy um, to do it in the formats we have. Um, but three methods I'm working with, and I, I have tried our um, intercultural reflection in the classroom, in, in intercultural learning groups that are mixed, um, training in perspective taking and perspective shifting, for example, by role plays, when you have to put yourself in the role of the bad guy, for example, um, and you need to experience it by yourself. Um, and also um, reflecting and improving the way we talk to each other, but also the way we talk about each other. Um, and this includes, um, for me, uh, gender-sensitive language. Um, and um, one, one way I found very, um, very good, and I had um, a format where, where we could train people um, uh, in, in a way to, to communicate interculturally uh, with each other, was um, um, for several years I have taught an advanced uh, studies group training course for imams and religious leaders. Um, and congregational welfare workers. And many imams who participated uh, in that course for the first time spoke to imams from other linguistic or ethnic communities and exchanged their different views about um, Islam and the way they see um, their community and society. Um, and the Christian and the Jewish participants um, some of them for the first time did talk to a Muslim in that course and that was possible because we had small groups and it was a protected space um, and so it was possible to exchange views um, and, and learn about the stance of the other side and um, the way they see um, society and the way they see um, religious guidance in society and I think that is um, important as well. I, I'm, I'm not, um, I don't mean that we have to teach religious thoughts at university. There are other places for that, but um, religion certainly has, um, still has its place in society, and we need to acknowledge that. 
But you're also um, saying that it's important that educational leaders and educational institutions, they train to assume someone else's perspective, that the concept of empathy alone is not enough. So, Rudi Höcker, when you look um, in your institution, do you train this as well? Education of the heart, meaning trying to understand someone else's point of view. I think education of the heart is only possible in close connection with education of the brain. It cannot be separated, otherwise it might go wrong. But if the education of the brain, like in the example I showed it, increasing knowledge in anatomy and at the same time increasing skills in dealing in dissecting a fish, if that leads to joint questions between teachers and students, and to those precious moments when neither teachers nor students have final answers, that's where the heart comes in. And, and that's why these moments are so precious, because there the sense of community of which His Holiness is speaking can grow up. Then there is a real community of those who are jointly searching and not the ones knowing and the other ones learning. That's for me cultivation of the heart. But is it something that, you know, I, I don't want to make the difference between teaching in a monastery or in a Tibetan environment and with the Zurich University of Applied Sciences, but do you still need the education of the heart or is it already part of the program anyway, you know, to, to know that you are there as a monk or as a nun to promote happiness or uh, to have the well-being of the others at the core? of the education. Of course, teaching nuns and monks in that respect is different from teaching in a college or in a university in a gymnasium here, because that culture of the heart education of which His Holiness is speaking is right there. There we are rather the learners. But then the exchange and the coming together for me is so important. Uh, and. Uh, they, the way they asked the question, the way the lady I was talking about gave the answer about where does consciousness originate, uh, that's a question in which there is so much heart and not only scientific curiosity. And the lady was capable to give an answer which responded both at the scientific and at the heart level. That, I think, is very important when we teach in monasteries in India or in Recon. Now, when we speak about education of the heart, let's move from the world of the nuns and monks to the world of the investment bankers. <laughs> Leandro Huber, when you will start studying economics, um, I'm not saying it's all bad, I'm just saying the principle of a neoliberal world is that, you know, it's all about money, it's about materialistic values, and the Dalai Lama said in his introduction, our education still focuses too much on money and on material values. Um, what will you be looking at when you start, or if you started studying economics? Uh, to be honest, I've been a lazy student up until now. I haven't been to many classes in economics. Um, the Dalai Lama will like that, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I've, I've been to a lot of courses and classes within my communications um, bachelor. And there, uh, I think that most of the time, we don't really speak about universal values such as compassion, acceptance, tolerance, things like that. It's more really the focus on values which can be monetarized. Effectiveness, um, efficiency, such things. And they're really the focus of the education nowadays is, from my point of view. Um, for example, we, we, we spoke a lot about corporate social responsibility within our, uh, our studies. and. There, instead of speaking really about the values behind corporate social responsibility, what I, as a member of the team, can do for a good um, company, what the company itself can do in order to, to act uh, social responsibly, um, we more speak about how we can sell that we as a company do corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I think um, from time to time it would be really good to speak about the values itself. 
So do you think that the Dalai Lama's vision of um, the idea, the well-being of the other should be at the center of ethical decision-making will be part of your educational program? I think it would be beneficial to have more time to discuss um, about the values. Um, we should have more time to discuss with one and each other on a peer-to-peer -peer level, mm -hmm. um, not straight out of, of books where we just see, okay, that's how it's made and that's how it's done and, and, and finish. But I think we, again, need more time to speak from one and another, to just learn from each other. And let's be honest, it's not just, you know, the economy that um, is being discussed here. It's you represent uh, being a student of economy. But when I look at today's um, business world, uh, your holiness, it's still all about hierarchy, ranks. It's about being promoted or not being promoted. It's about statues. Do you sometimes think that reality somehow undermines your idea of the education of the heart, that the well-being of the other is at the center of decision-making? Mm. Yes, materialistic life. Uh, see, uh, pure materialistic life is, what is it, I think, sensorial level. Now, firstly, what is consciousness? When I discuss with a modern scientist, Western scientist, uh, consciousness mainly refers to senses of organs, not what we call sixth mind. I remember, I think, 79, my first visit to Moscow, then still Soviet Union because their relation with China becomes something difficult. So, Soviet Union allowed me to visit Moscow. So, at that time, I met some Russian scientist. Uh, when I mentioned sense of organs, five, then sixth mind, they immediately reject. Uh, the concept of sixth mind is religious concept. So they do not know about the world of mind. Whereas in India, over 3,000 years, you see, already realized, beside five senses of organs, sixth mind there. Sixth mind can, through training, can change can, uh, say they, really. for example, anger, attachment, related with sixth mind, not organs, sense of organs. Then similarly, compassion, related with sixth mind. So those good quality of sixth mind, you see, can increase through training. So, before Buddha come, already in India, the concept of meditation already there. So meditation means uh, training our sixth mind, not organs. So now modern scientists, you see the brain, the major portion, this side, front side, related with sensible organs. Then here, mandala, a mandala, that is related with sixth mind. So now scientists, uh, till the later part of the 20th century, the scientists, especially brain sci scientists, you see, they reject 
existence of mind, only brain. Now, the more investigation, experiment. Now, later part of the 20th century, a uh, uh, number of brain specialists. Now they begin to feel, oh, there's something which, which can affect our brain. So when you... So, so for example, you see, through meditation, plus neuroplasticity. Lepta. Song is referring to neuroplasticity. Can change through meditation. So now they begin to, uh, and then also there are a number of cases, person who clinically dead, but body remain very fresh, including my own tutor. Thirteen days remain body very fresh. And then some cases, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, body remain very fresh. But brain dead. So with the help of some American brain specialist, now we already developed some sort of project to specially, for specially sort of because investigation, such case. So you may. So now, now begin. <laughs> number of brain specialists now they begin to accept there is something. Whether we call mind, or consciousness, or something there. So this Asian tradition. Now, of course, I respect all religion. Uh, because I, my, one of my commitments is promotion of religious harmony. So mutual respect is very essential. So I respect Judeo-Christian tradition. But there are differences. Judeo-Christian tradition, there is creator. So only prayer to God. Whereas Indian tradition, no God, some, some Indian tradition, no God, no creator, but rather self-creation. So all responsibility relying on one's, oneself. Then five senses of organs, uh, not much sort of important, the sixth mind. Therefore, over 3,000 years, the tradition of meditation already developed. The Buddha uh, himself product of Indian tradition. So now today, uh, Indian tradition, a lot of sort of knowledge about mind, uh, how to tackle this destructive emotion within training of mind, not drugs or some other thing. So the fundamentally, Western civilization based on Judeo-Christian tradition. So not talking about this as a day, because of the self-creation, but rather God. The Indian tradition, self-creation. So self, very important. So then mind. Uh, so like that. So therefore, ancient Indian psychology, knowledge about mind uh, originally come from religious tradition. But we should take these are academic subject, as I mentioned earlier, for the hygiene of emotion. We need more knowledge, the whole sort of function or system of our emotion. But wouldn't you say that it's exactly the hygiene of the emotion and uh, the idea of mindfulness that is under a lot of pressure in these days, when the Dalai Lama strengthened the importance of um, um, tradition of 
meditation 3,000 years old and we live in disruptive times also on a technological level. Every student has got an iPhone today, every child has an iPhone. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to grab the attention of the young generation. So I would like to know how can we promote the idea of mindfulness and being attentive to one thing as a universal human wa value in today's time? Rudi Höker. Or is it in the monastery not an issue at all? Rudi Höker, I would like to know, have you, have you seen a change with the monks and the nuns, even, you know, living in these disruptive times where we have to teach mindfulness as a concept, but we live in disruptive times? I have seen individual examples where work of the kind that His Holiness has described now, work on oneself, also perhaps through Western psychotherapy, which today goes into similar directions, that people have changed very considerably and have become able to do mar re remarkable work both at the intellectual and at the practical and at the social level. So the effectiveness of what His Holiness is talking about for me, from a few examples that I have been experiencing myself, is without question. But you feel that they're distracted more than they used to be in these modern days? Would you please repeat the question, is it? Yeah, do you feel that they're distracted more than they used to be because we have all these technological devices yeah, yeah, and yeah. that we're interconnected all the time? Yes, definitely. It is more attractive today, as I experience among young people much more than it was when I was as young as my neighbor here. <laughs> so then let me pass the question to Leandro Huber. Do you think that value of mindfulness is under pressure in the young generation that you belong to? Yeah, it's difficult, me, uh, difficult for me to compare. Um, just as tell us about your world. Just tell us about your world. From my point of view, it's, it's, it's really difficult because um, attentiveness, from my point of view, is really, um, has a lot to do with interest. So if I'm really interested in something, I, I pay a lot of attention. And the problem with the smartphone is that um, there are a lot of very interesting things going on right inside of my pocket. So I'm able to look outside in the world with just one click and there are a whole lot of very interesting things. Um, so paying attention to interesting things then really is easier than before. Yeah. But we appreciate that you stayed with us for this hour <laughs> without checking your iPhone. So mindfulness as a, as a value, as a universal human value, is it under pressure, do you believe? Have we lost that value on the way, maybe? I, th I don't think I have an answer. I have several questions. I mean, as Leandro Huber pointed out, what exactly does it mean if I, uh, I'm concentrated and focused working with, with a digital device, I could be mindful as well. So that's, that's my question number one. And does speed mean I'm not mindful? I mean, there, there, there are many, many questions to answer this. So... I'm not so sure. And, and is it more that we as the older generation perceive the younger generation as less mindful as generations before have seen us? So I'm not, not sure. Even so often I think, yes, you're right, maybe there is a loss of mindfulness if I look at theaters that shorten all kinds of classical pieces to one hour, uh, digestive pieces, whatever it is, if it's a Shakespeare or Gothi or Schiller, whatever, so I feel like, okay, yes, maybe that's the problem. But, 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 but then looking at it from a, from a more sociological perspective, I, I really don't know. So um, maybe when we were young, we were immersing ourselves into comics and reading that for three hours and somebody felt they were doing crap. So I, I, I'm not so sure whether we really know what, 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 what we are talking of. And even if we talk about the younger generation, their concept is maybe more selfish in a certain way, that they want a life with a better uh, 
work-life balance. But then what's bad about it? I mean, so we have to ask these questions. We, we can't just say, okay, there is a loss of mindfulness. And they are young people who go out and uh, do um, environmental work or uh, are in a peace workforce, etc. So, so I, I, I'm not so sure. I, I observe different um, trends or developments at the same time. And, and, and for me, it's hard to, so to no, judge and no evaluate. Cultural pessimism from, from your side, when we talk about values, you know, implying that it's some fixed concept um, with continuity, but we live in an ever-changing world, do you think we are losing some values on the way, like mindfulness being under pressure with technological progress? No, I, I wouldn't um, term that as a loss, because um, if we are changing and um, um, developing into a new direction, we um, create new values and we, we find new things. And actually, I don't uh, believe that young peoples and our students um, have uh, uh, a lack in mindfulness, um, exactly for the reasons Andreas um, talked about. Um, they work a lot in, um, in uh, um, peace work or environmental work or something like that. And um, what, what makes me, um, or what, what is a worry for me is uh, rather that um, we may uh, perhaps um, be seduced to let ourselves be relieved of thinking for ourselves by the ever uh, larger amount of data that is around there and the ever quicker um, response we get by big data resources. So um, I think we need to focus in education as well on um, reflecting very well um, this um, interdependency between digital possibilities and the personal and social responsibility how to work with it and the reflection um, uh, should, should be part of the um, uh, integrating it into uh, the learning environment. So call for action for critical thinking. Let me finish the, the round about mindfulness with a personal question to your holiness. You're an Instagram star. You're a Twitter star. I assume that you have a staff, you know, feeding these accounts for you, but you know that social media is important today to bring a message across. And you have many, many, many followers, millions of followers. Did you know about that? <laughs> so my question is... Yeah, so my question is, do you deal with the question of being distracted by social media, you know, from your meditation, that it's harder to focus in these days? Has it ever happened to you that you check your iPhone rather than going meditating? <laughs> because we very much emphasis sensorial, then music, uh, some sports, uh, good taste, and smell, and touch, including sex. Since we too much emphasis sensorial level, so the material life also is developed. So attraction automatically comes. If you have some training about the sixth mind, then sensorial so consciousness can neutralize. You can see, but your mind not follow. Because uh, of that. External stimulus. Uh, oh. Okay. External stimulus the, is distracting. So therefore, the, firstly, it is important to realize uh, senses of organs and the sixth mind. When I discuss with some Western scientists, when we uh, touch the subject of uh, mind or consciousness, they only refer sens sensorial organs, sensorial consciousness. So that is, uh, you see, the 
and then very limited. The real potential of mind is sixth mind. So, uh, I consider the, as a student of Nalanda tradition. At the Nalanda tradition, very much emphasis on reason, investigation, analytical sort of meditation. Analyze, analyze everything, including religious subject. The important thing is why, why? This is very important. The Judo Christian tradition, yes, 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 yes. Whatever God say, yes, yes, yes. The, even Buddha say something, we have the right to investigate. Why Buddha stated this? If we find a contradiction through reasoning, then we have the right to reject even Buddha's own sort of teaching. That is something quite unique. So that's why so the, the Buddhist tradition, particularly the knowledge tradition, logic, very important, not just faith. So therefore, uh, our sort of training is always to investigate, investigate, and experiment. Therefore, over th uh, now nearly 40 years, I have serious discussion with modern scientists. No problem. At the, at the beginning, some people give me warning, oh, science is killer of religion, so be careful. I start discuss with scientists. Then, uh, eventually, it becomes very clear. With meeting with scientists, it's really helpful, mutual learning. We learn some new things from scientific findings. And they learn very useful information about mind. Uh, now, four fields cosmology, neurobiology, then physics, particularly quantum physics, then psychology. So, uh, I think there's uh, differences Eastern philosophy, ancient Indian sort of philosophy. Always is important, emphasis importance of reasoning, investigation. So, your Western world, Judo Christian sort of tradition. So, it is better to keep your own tradition. I do not want to interfere with <laughs> your, your tradition. But I am sure that there's people in the room who would like to ask a question to you, Your Holiness. So this is the moment where I would like to open the questions to the floor. So whoever has a question, please give us a signal by rising, raising your head, uh, hand, and then we have microphones in the room. Give us some time to come towards you. So who would like to ask a question um, to the Dalai Lama? I have one. This is a great you, have, you want to ask yourself a one, question, one, one, that's good. One great friend, <laughs> one great friend of scientist, he Jews. So he, uh, I said that, uh, I said that uh, several years so we discussed these things. So he really showing interest about Buddhism. Then one day his wife warned him, we are Jewish. We should keep Judaism. <laughs> the, her husband, the scientist, now they really start to practice some of Buddhist sort of practice like that. So similarly, I I I want to tell you, you are follower of Judo Christian tradition. So don't ask these complicated questions. <laughs> 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 yes, okay, 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 okay. You know, if there's no question in the room, I take the liberty. Is there one? Okay. Yes, I don't know where the microphones are. Maybe someone gives me a signal or you come towards the stage. 
I have many simple questions for you People left, Dalai Lama. Don't you worry, yes. Your Holiness. Welcome. One here. Yes. One here. So first, thank you so much for coming, Your Holiness. And um, my question would be, you said that it's very important that we teach young children to take care of their emotions. How should we teach them? You need to research. I have no experience. <laughs> Overall, I think a teacher should know about the system of emotion. Then explain to children with full love. Teacher, without love, without taking serious care about the future of the children, uh, just the knowledge, not much effect. So, according to Eastern tradition, the first quality of teacher is loving kindness, take care. And then, uh, I think you should study uh, ancient Indian or say the psychology. Then, how to tackle these emotion can be useful. Okay. The detail, I don't know. I have no experience. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Thank you. So the microphones are located at the fixed spot here in the room. Whoever would like to One ask a question here. has to come towards the microphone. Yes. Because otherwise we can't hear you. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So my question is regarding technology again. And we hear every day now about artificial intelligence and machine replacing humans. Does the Holiness, the Dalai Lama, see any risk that the humans will re be replaced by these artificial intelligences in the future? And what can we do yes, in order many, that this doesn't happen? Yes, many scientists, they really believe machine eventually can work uh, without our mind, brain. I don't think these machines are very useful. But ultimately, the controller or making machine is we human being. So no matter how sort of machine sophisticated, I think still human brain is, I think, more sophisticated. I feel. I think the small size here. Hmm. Our computer, brain computer here, I think if you really make similar sort of kasoda ability or brain, then I think computer hold this whole, I think. <laughs> big computer. If you all use our brains. Is there another question from the floor to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama? Next question? Yes, there's someone coming on the right side. Hi. <laughs> My question is, how do you find peace of mind? <laughs> Through training, analyze. What is the value of anger? What is the value of too much stress? On the other hand, the value of peace of mind or compassion. Through, anal an through analyze, I develop full conviction, anger, uh, hatred. These are no use. Uh, the opposite mind, compassion, forgiveness, these are really very useful. So through or say they analyze, I can, we, we can develop full conviction. This destructive emotion is no use. Uh, positive emotion, constructive emotion, very use. So that attitude out of or say they, uh, knowledge, conviction, automatically positive emotion increasing. The destructive emotion automatically reduced. Then Buddhist psychology, even as the quantum physicist, some quantum physicists, they believe 
the person who really believes nothing exists, because as appears, if you investigate, nothing. So such quantum physicists, their sort of emotional level, extreme view is much less. So then, all those destructive emotion, actually, according to in Indian psychology, all these destructive emotion based on ignorance, wrong view. Constructive emotion based on reason. One of my American uh, psychologists, he helping people who too much disturb their mind due to anger. So he, he not, not a religious-minded person. Uh, once he told me, when person develop anger, the object to which they feel angry appears very negative, but 90% of that negativeness is mental projection. So ignorance, wrong view, all this destructive emotion uh, very much mixed with wrong view. So wrong view and the uh, the the result of the understanding of reality. Oh, opposite. So all this destructive emotion, no sound basis. Uh, constructive emotion, sound base. So we can train. Eventually, destructive emotion can uh, also reduce. Then furthermore, the very nature of our sixth mind, or all mind, not uh, what's it, the nature, uh, not, not in the nature of emotion, but it's like uh, water, pure. But due to this is certain emotion, because of the spoil, that water becomes dirty. So mind remains, stand still, and think, 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 think. Then the very nature of mind clear, come. So that is the basis of we can eliminate all destructive emotion. We've got time for another question. Meanwhile, meanwhile, I just want to know, I mean, you've been doing a lot of training, I guess. Your Holiness, are you free of negative emotions? Do you never feel anger Almost or jealousy? None. Almost none. But when I was young, I usually telling people, my two, my parents, my father, very short temper, <laughs> and my mother, is always smiling, always very kind. So I usually telling my first teacher of kindness, loving kindness, is my mother. Uh, so my life, early part of my life, I follow my father, short temper. Later part of my life, I follow my mother. Heritage of both. So we have one more question here in the room. Please come forward. Do you have an idea how to motivate people to consume less um, without laws and prohibitions? Kosa. Could you repeat the question? Because it was difficult to hear it acoustically. Do you have ideas how to motivate people to consume less? without laws and prohibitions. Any facility of material, in any way, there is limitation. Uh, so in any way, there is limitation, so better to content. Mental level, sort of quality, no limitation. So better uh, 
그래서 without 그래서 content 그래서 초심 해보세요. 심기 위한데 그다 심기 위한데 탐에 뭐 배투기 위한 인도산에 초심 해보세요. 두자가 응어부디 간다 타제로 타여 위한 인도산에 이제 초심이죠. So regarding regarding the qualities that you can cultivate and within. There is no limit to it. Therefore, you should never be satisfied with this cultivation of the good qualities. Whereas, in the case of the you know external matters, uh, there is some limitation anyway. Therefore, you should always be able to show uh, you know contentment. I have some friend, some American, I think really billionaire, uh, very rich, but mentally very unhappy. Uh, one occasion, I met one uh, chancellor of a big university. I think a student, uh, I think uh, more than 20, 30,000 students. So that chancellor, and his salary, very good. And as a chancellor, educated, and also is a good name. But as a human being, very unhappy. I spent, I think, one hour by drive. Uh, then we talk, and then he told me he very hard, unhappy. So later, uh, the worker in his office, so secretary or this, they also, you see, uh, later you see, express before uh, uh, our meeting, the chancellor always prefer remain in the corner of the office, a little bit dark. After our meeting, uh, our met, so he become very much active. So I think workers prefer previous one. He not much, or say they give instruction, he himself, remain like that. Afterward, too much work. <laughs> so like that, very, a lot of money, Fame, the highly developed modern education, but emotionally unhappy. Too much sort of emotion. I talk, I talk him, then gradually uh, uh, he found, I also noticed at the beginning his face, too much stress. Then I talk, then gradually his face becomes something peace, like that. So therefore, Modern education alone, no guarantee to bring inner peace. Because your modern education very much oriented about material value. Now modern education should include, as I mentioned earlier, hygiene of emotion. With that, you see, some education about our mind, emotion, then how to tackle. That's very important. So, time is up, but I would like to take one last question. It's from the first um, row here. Maybe I pass the microphone, or you speak up in a very loud voice so one can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is the following. If I listen to His Holiness, everything is so clear in his saying. When the audience starts to speak, it becomes complicated. And I don't know anymore whom I should believe. So I would uh, expect that we end up this morning with quotations by His Holiness, who makes everything so evident and clear. And I am so grateful that he is here. And in, in, contrast to the audience doesn't make any mistakes. We will find, we will finish this morning with a quote by the Dalai Lama, so don't you worry. I thought you had a I question, <laughs> but why don't we um, finish up now? I would like to um, ask from every one of you, just maybe that is a good compromise, um, what a sentence of the Dalai Lama that you heard during this morning, what statement or what idea will you take home to your classrooms, to your lecturing? Maybe we start with Rudi Höcker. 
our self-responsibility for any change that is going to happen around me has again been so well emphasized, I take it along. Self-responsibility, I have to change, then things around can change. Thank you. Christiane Hohenstein, what is your takeaway? I, I very much uh, like the idea of emotional hygiene, and I'm thinking about that uh, further. And um, the idea, um, His Holiness started out with um, that we need to emphasize away from the secondary values and differences and uh, need to, um, to set priorities differently. Andreas Gerber Grote. Uh, I strongly think that empathy is a very important value, though maybe I can relate to the statement that we just had. It's our ongoing task to then interpret this in our culture, in our daily life, every day anew. And that's maybe the big problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Leandro Huber, what is it that you take away from the Dalai Lama this morning? For me, it is the concept of analytical meditation and the whole idea of thinking about the why and then get rid of the useful things. That's really what I take away. Thank you. And your <laughs> <laughs> and Your Holiness, the, the man in the first row, he would, had one wish that we could take away one sentence of you this morning, one quote. So what's the sentence that we all shall take home today from your visit? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mm. <laughs> I think there's not a lot to add to that one, although my, <laughs> my favorite quote of yours is a very simple one. It's not tied to education, but it can be seen in the context of education. Um, you once said, Your Holiness, be kind whenever possible and it is always possible. So I guess with that, I would like to close this morning. Um, I think that's a good idea not to rest, not to forget about this. I would like to thank um, Your Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, to come here to Winterthur and sharing your thoughts. It was a great honor. I would like to thank to the audience here in this room. I also would like to thank to everyone who was watching us via live stream or in one of the auditoriums of Zurich University of Applied Sciences. And above all, I would like to thank to our distinguished panelists, Christiane Hohenstein, um, Mr. Gerber Grote, Mr. Huber, and also Rudi Höcker. I think a warm round of applause from um, everybody will finish this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Good work. Your Holiness, Honorable Rector, where? <laughs> Dear panel members, students, and guests. With great interest and gratitude, I have listened to your inspiring words, Your Holiness, and to the subsequent panel discussion on universal human values and education. To focus at university level on ethical issues arising in our modern society, it is a great opportunity and it is a meaningful contribution to the celebration of the Tibet Institute's 50th anniversary. Thus, as the president of the Tibet Institute Recon, I would like to thank all those who have made this symposium possible. I am presently not only speaking on behalf of the Tibet Institute,
but also as a mediator and lecturer at the University of Teachers Education in Bern. Ethics and universal human values are emphasized at various levels of the Swiss educational system. For example, at elementary school level, the subject called nature, individual and society offers countless opportunities to stimulate students' interests in ethical issues. Another example is actual pedagogical research, which, among others, focuses on the question to what extent the well-being and success of students depend on their achieved social integration. A third example is found in the training curriculum for future secondary school teachers, for them, ethics is a compulsory field of study at university level. Finally, I should like to refer to the program of complementary training for headmasters and school directors. Participants are invited to discuss the role of ethics in the management of their schools. In my view, it is of growing importance to help pupils, students, teachers and their headmasters, school directors and lecturers to cultivate secular ethics and to promote an approach to emotional hygiene, which means emotional mindfulness and emotional perception. Your Holiness, what you have explained to us today was particularly helpful in this respect. I am so grateful for it. Thank you very much. Today's symposium is the fourth and last public event of the Tibet Institute's 50th anniversary, an event marked by the presence of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Thus, on behalf of the Tibet Institute, I want to express my sincere thanks to the Zurich University of Applied Sciences for their extraordinary commitment and organizational achievement in this respect and also to the Ganden Podan Foundation of His Holiness the Dalai Lama for their great support and cooperation. It is my hope that the present event will stimulate further discussions and efforts at various educational levels to strengthen universal human values in our society and through the other world. Your Holiness, on behalf of the Tibet Institute Recon, of which you are the patron, I wish you the best of health and strength in all your undertakings. May your return travel to India be safe. We will never forget these days marked by your presence and your blessings. Thank you so much. Tokchi Chena. Thank you, Kama Lopsang, for, for your concluding words. As I mentioned at the beginning, we had about 1,000 people here listening to you today, to your words, Your Holiness. However, the impact of today's event is much greater. It will make a lasting impression. And not only as the memory of a deep and intensive moment, but as a source of energy and inspiration. And the impression will go beyond this and will reach other people in our university, but, out, but also outside. I hope that the students present here today will be future ambassadors for the strong messages of universal tolerance and dialogue that you are bringing to us today. Finally, I would like to thank all the people who make this even possible, but I would like to thank you, uh, your audience, once again for visiting our university. And since this is the last stop in your visit to Switzerland, I would also like to wish you a good journey.